Servants, obey your masters in everything. Obey all the time, even when they can't see you. Don't just pretend to work hard so that they will treat you well. No, you must serve your masters honestly because you respect the Lord. In all the work you are given, do the best you can. Work as though you are working for the Lord, not any earthly master. Remember that you will receive your reward from the Lord, who will give you what he promised his people. Yes, you are serving Christ. He is your real master. Remember that anyone who does wrong will be punished for that wrong, and the Lord treats everyone the same. And then chapter 4, verse 1 says, Masters, give what is good and fair to your servants. Remember that you have a master in heaven. All right, so there are three key elements, kind of abstract elements that I took out of this passage that I want to kind of tell you about today to think about. First of all, question that I'm asking is, what does the traditional or social work relationship look like? What do we really expect when we go to work? And then what are the traditional or, in quotes, normal motivations for work? Why do we go and do that every day? And then how should our relationship and motivations change because of our new life in Christ. And Paul's already given us some hints, but we'll unpack that a little bit more. Okay, so I talked a little bit about my different career paths, whatever, um, and, and roles that I've had over, over the last 30 years. Um, and you know, as a guy, it's hard to not have work define who you are. We talked last night um, in the marriage group, said, said what, what's the first thing when two guys meet, what do they ask each other? Well, what do you do? So we, as men, we tend to define ourselves as what we do. I'm a sales guy. I'm a computer engineer. I'm a pastor. Whatever that thing is. But is that really true? Are we really defined by what we do? Or, as Paul says, are we defined by who we are? And then even better, if you're a Christian, defined by who Jesus is. So I've started to think about this passage. Well, not started. It's been a while. Because <clears throat> in his wisdom, um, or not, Seth invites people like me to preach now and again to come up here. Uh, the elders prepare a message once or twice a year. I say invites, but it's really a strong suggestion. Um, <laughs> otherwise, we'd never do it. <laughs> so I, I think it was an elder meeting way back in March where Seth kind of unpacked his summer teaching program uh, and the messages and the dates. And this date came up as empty, and he asked somebody if they, would, you know, the elders, if somebody would like to take the day, and talk about uh, the topic. And without looking at the topic, I was like, "I'll do that one," because it was the furthest away in time. <laughs> so I've had months to procrastinate on getting it done. So, and I finished the final version at 9.30 p.m. last night, which is why you might be struggling to follow me. It's not your fault, it's mine. Uh, we'll get back on track soon. Okay, so I accepted this teaching assignment against my better judgment, but hopeful that things would be different, because really, what happens is that God generally gives people who dare to stand up here at all and try and proclaim his word a really good workout on the topic. So... Um, it's really to keep us honest so we can be marginally less hypocritical about what we're telling you to do. <laughs> anyway, so this is what happened over the past six months. Um, this could be a very long story. I'll try my best to keep it, as I said, under an hour and a half today. So a small company that I work for, a small software company here in Costa Mesa, has kind of been in a turnaround. Um, I don't know if you even know what that means, but what it, what it typically means is a group are professionals and managers with a long tenure and track record in their specific function and expertise are kind of invited by investors to come into a company that's maybe been struggling or has great potential and hasn't lived that out because there's an owner who doesn't want to relinquish his grip on the company um, and come in and literally turn it around from a mom and pop or a struggling company into something that could be successful over the next few years. So you generally come in with, with an expertise and then you're given that task and you work as a team and you hire and fire and do all the, all the stuff that you need to do. Sounds like fun, can be, hasn't been. So, um, so really what we did is we came up with a three-year plan 
And it started with first year, kind of what do we have? Stop the brain damage, stop the bleeding, put proper policies and procedures in place, write real contracts, do all the good things that a big grown-up company would do, but start small. And then year two, we're going to replicate that, scale it out, hire a bunch of people, start growing, and seeing if we can actually make money doing this. And then if we could, year three, what you're going to try and do is take a little bit more investment and go big, and then grow like crazy, and then hopefully that's going to invite somebody to buy you out at a multiple of what you're producing. Okay, that's the plan. Sounds like a great plan. It was a good plan. But wow, it's hard work. So especially that first year where you're coming in, and uh, we, we came in and started to understand that the market that we, we sell this software solution to is talent acquisition, which is a fancy word for recruiters. Um, and they prefer cheap over quality, unfortunately, because they don't really have a budget to spend on recruiting people. They do it kind of ad hoc with credit cards, and the rest of the company funds them. So they're not very popular when it comes to buying stuff. So it was hard, it's been hard. <clears throat> and our particular message and product is a premium service, so it's much higher priced than anything else in the market. We sell video interviewing, as I guess everyone here has done a Skype or a FaceTime. You basically use video to interview somebody, it's free. Well, we'll charge you 100 bucks to do that. <laughs> so it's a hard message to get out there that there's value in the way that we do it. Anyway, so we did okay. We did okay. We got a lot of customers solidified under contract, started growing. Uh, came into here to uh, showing signs that we could succeed if we kept focused and we didn't all just flame out. Um, and right around the time I was putting my big dumb paw in the air to volunteer to do this today, our company owners decided they wanted out as soon as possible and put the company up for sale. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of in this wow, we could do okay, but we haven't had the time to do it. So what that meant practically as a team was you have a budget locked down, you're not allowed to spend any more money, you're not hiring anybody, and you're just kind of on your own, and the focus shifts to trying to grow a company to prepping a company for sale. It's a completely different way of operating. Okay, so what does that mean for me? Sales guy like to get out there and do demos, talk to people, understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, what's not working, and then hopefully come up with a solution that they will go, oh, that's worth $100,000 a year. Well, instead of that, all I'm doing is tons of documentation every day of what the process was, reporting on all the numbers, and building spreadsheets. This is such joy for a person like me. <laughs> And so this thing, this process has ground its way through the past six months of roller coaster. Oh, we're going to be bored. No, we're not. Oh, they're going to buy us. No, they're not. Oh, we're going to get a million dollars of investment to just, no, we're not. <laughs> um, and what we're going to happen, actually, maybe even tomorrow, we'll see, is sold to a direct competitor. So now add the layers of minutia and spreadsheeting and reporting to your biggest direct competitors now probing and questioning everything you do, and that just adds to the joy of showing up to work every day. And of course, it's a small company, so the word gets out, so we've lost staff, which just puts more back onto management. Uh, we've lost customers. We've had tremendous tension between the owners and the managers, because we don't really want to go through this. Um, I lost much more business than I gained over the last year and personally had my commissions cut in half. So, it's been a grind. Some mornings I've woken up just hoping to feel sick or be dead so I didn't have to go in. So what a great message for me to deliver to you. Work at everything as if working for Jesus. Be peaceful, be loving, be kind. I have failed in every which way in the past six months. Let's look at how I could have done better if I'd actually read this thing earlier. <laughs> okay, so let's look at what the traditional, the social relationship to work is. Why, why do we work? Why do we work? Well, as I unpack this, <clears throat> the world is just that way. It's built that way. We, uh, we're we're meant to work. It's a predominant way of life for the human species. 
And the Sunday school answer is, God created work. This is not a novel thing that man came up with. God is a worker. That's how he defines himself right in Genesis from the start. What did God do right in the beginning? He worked. He made everything. That implies effort, expending energy, thought, design. He's a worker. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, uh, where God finished the work he was doing, and on the seventh day, he rested from his work. He got a break. I didn't. So God describes this creative activity that he did in, in creating everything as work. So he looked on what he had created, his work, and he saw it was good. So there is an inherent nobility, there's an inherent goodness in work that he passes on to us. It's satisfying to our soul when we work, when we accomplish stuff. It fulfills a deep need in us, especially men, but women too. It gives us purpose. It gives us a, a place to belong and a role and a purpose. And that actually creates a framework for us where we can worship God. So that's what I hope to impart on you today. We'll come back. So then we read in, uh, well, we read previously, that's kind of a little bit backwards here, but Genesis chapter 1, verse 15, the Lord God put the man that he had created, Adam, in the Garden of Eden to work the soil and take care of the garden. So Adam's very first purpose, as revealed in the Bible, is to work. He's going to tend the garden, and he's going to work the soil. So Adam was a farmer. So was he defined then by his work as a farmer? No, he was defined by his relationship with God as his creation, but he is still a worker. So working is natural, it feels right when we work to accomplish something, especially if God has given us that work directly to do. Okay, so what was Adam's reward for his work? Well, God provided for his every need. He was there with him in the garden. So he came to him in the cool of the garden. And I can only imagine, the Bible doesn't say this, but friends. Okay, there's a master-servant relationship. God be master, Adam's servant. But really colleagues, if you like. And I can imagine God said, how was your day at work today? What did you do? And he's like, well, there were 14 beetles eating my roses. And I had to deal with them. I hope you didn't kill them. <laughs> no, I picked them up and I moved them to another part of the garden. Where they come. So, so there's, there's something in this relationship with God doing this work. God provided for his needs. So the perfect work relationship is defined with God as master and Adam as servant. And as Adam honors the Lord with his toil, the Lord honors Adam's, Adam with his presence, his perfect provision for everything. Uh, and his relationship constantly, perfectly, directly, one-to-one. -one. Well, this didn't last very long, as we know, <clears throat> right? With the disobedience of Adam and Eve came the consequences of God's justice in response to disobedience, to what the Bible calls sin. But he's missing God's mark, his standard for relationship with him. So Genesis 3, verse 17 and on, God said to the man, I commanded you not to eat from that tree, but you listened to your wife and you ate from it. So I will curse the ground because of you. You will have to work hard all of your life for the food that the ground produces. The ground will grow thorns and weeds for you, and you will have to eat the plants that grow wild in the fields. You will work hard for your food until your face is covered with sweat. You will work hard until the day you die, and then you will become dust again. I use dust to make you, and when you die, you'll become dust again. Isn't that comforting? <laughs> awesome! We're going to have to work while the sweat pours off our face. Hoping I'm not doing that right now. Well, of course, that, so you're speaking to Adam, but Eve was given uh, even more difficult consequences regarding childbearing and raising uh, and, and her relationship to Adam, her husband. You know, and the old saying is a woman's work is never done. Um, a lot of you ladies I know go out to work in the workplace, you come home, the dishes are there, some of you, the baby's there, and your husband's there, and you have to take care of them all. For us, at least, we get kind of a break. We go to work, we come home, and most guys, like, take a break. <clears throat> so the relationship now has changed. We don't work directly for God anymore. We work indirectly to him to sustain ourselves for survival. That's what that passage really tells us. We are 
We kind of have to survive through our work. Uh, he provides what we need, but our direct material and primary needs are meant through slavery to the earth, or for some of us, slavery to work, to a corporation. So society, society progressed as we go through. People discovered that they could work better together, they could uh, create corporations um, and become business owners, and then they could employ or enslave, back in the old day, others to do that hard work for them, and they could kind of kick back and own this thing. Um, so over time, the notion of working for God, even indirectly, has been replaced for working for self. We work for ourselves, generally. That's our traditional way that society looks at work. Okay, and you don't, even, I would say even 50 years ago, you could go into a workplace, join a company, and kind of work your whole life there, and retire and get a pension. It doesn't happen so often anymore. That kind of notion of loyalty and working for a cause or a specific company is gone, and now it's, I work for me. And I'm gonna take my talents, and I'm going to kind of offer them up for the highest bid, and I'm gonna move when I need to. And, and uh, you know, technology has allowed us to do that with the internet and with the boom in tech. People are very mobile, so I'm sure a lot of you here know that. You can kind of take your, your skills and you can move from one company to another very easily. All right, so the, so the kind of that relationship with work has changed tremendously over time. But here's something that hasn't changed. Um, there's always someone to report to. You can't escape that structure. Even if you own the corporation, the, the $10 billion company, you're reporting to somebody. You're reporting to a board. You're reporting to um, investors. There's always somebody that's going to be able to come in and probe and ask hard questions and make you sweat. So that fact is still there. So while, while we're here, uh, let me talk about unpaid work, because some people work really hard and they don't get paid for that. Um, but there's no difference. So moms at home, or dads for that matter, keeping house, raising kids, you're working in a social construct in almost exactly the same way. You've got people that you report to. You might not have a boss, but you've got a husband, um, you've got children, you've got a mother-in-law. And <laughs> so the same pressures are there, right? And it's the same with volunteers and public servants and, and pretty much everything that you can imagine in terms of doing work, you're going to answer to somebody. There's no escaping that relationship. Okay, are we clear? Is anybody lost? Just put up your hand so I can see if you're lost. Because Jesus will find you. Okay, so, so what are the motivations? Now we know about kind of the work construct, the relationship. What are the motivations? Why do we go to work? Okay, so... Work is God-given. It's necessary for survival. Are those the only motiv motivations to work? And I looked at myself and I thought, no, there, there are some others. There might be primary, there might be secondary, but there are other reasons that I go to work. One of them is to get rich, so I don't have to work. <laughs> that would be nice. Uh, one of them is self-esteem, self so I can feel good about myself uh, in my role as, as husband and father to provide for my family. Um, to help others, right? Um, especially a vocation, like a doctor, a lawyer, teacher, you're, you're really, part of your motivation is helping people, pastor, um, and then to be socially responsible, because it's good to work, um, and add to, to the economy. But here are some of the Old Testament verses I found related to work that I really resonated with. Proverbs uh, chapter 12, verse 24. Those who work hard will be put in charge of others. And, but lazy people have to work like slaves. I don't know which one I am right now. I'm like, I'm really confused. I want to be the first part, but I'm not so sure. And then Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 7, um, Solomon wrote that people work and work to feed themselves, but they are never satisfied. So yeah, I was like, yeah, I've worked so that we can eat well, but once you've had like one 24 rounds for a buy. <laughs> I am not satisfied, I want something else. So, oh, by the way, also in reading about work, uh, in numbers, the ideal work is to work in the tabernacle or the temple as a Levite. It's a perfect job. Um, they only started work at 25 years old, and they were done at 50. You were retired, and the community took care of you. 
you were kind of on call to help out if they needed you, but you, really, you basically just sat around and chatted with the other Levites that were unemployed. So it sounds good to me. But mostly our motivations are selfish, right? Mostly we don't really factor God into work at all. Uh, we, don't, we don't kind of put work-related decisions in God's economy or ask him. We, we just go ahead and we do it. Uh, we work because we must, and that's just the way it is. So we don't think about it all that much. Sometimes, for me, it means working as little as I can get away with, cutting corners, avoiding work, uh, putting it onto others, you know, producing the lowest acceptable quality work. Um, all these are really self-protective mechanisms so that I don't have to work so hard, and I don't have to be so burned out and hate my job. But these are not good things. Um, you know, especially as I've got older, I haven't had that tech startup unicorn sell for $2 billion. Um, I'm not the CEO, I'm still working somewhere in the middle ranks of the kind of the management of the, of the employee, the underappreciated, underpaid, and under the thumb of a manager kind of role. So that makes it hard sometimes to be motivated to work. But there are some good things. Um, some, you know, some, sometimes I have a motivational balance. Uh, I like to think of work as serving the community at some point, um, providing for my family. Uh, for others, it may be rising above poverty is a good reason to work. But there are lots of other reasons to work that are noble and encouraging. But there's a better way to be motivated. And that's exactly what we just read. And I'm going to read it again in case you missed the points. Okay, Paul outlines this again in this passage. <clears throat> if, if we embrace what he's telling us practically, it re almost returns us to that ideal work relationship in the garden of working directly for God and then relying on him for provision and relationship. Okay, so let's go through it again. So verse 22, servants, obey your masters in everything. He doesn't say obey your masters when you feel motivated. He doesn't say obey your masters when they're right. He says in everything. Now, of course, there is a, a theological or spiritual boundary there. You're not meant to obey your masters when they are going directly against the word of God. Then you can feel free to opt out of uh, obeying. You know, if they tell you to go kill people, mind you, if you're in military, you still have to obey that. So I guess there are some circumstances where, <laughs> where theologically you're not going to obey, but mostly you, you're going to obey everything that they tell you to do. And he says obey all the time, even when they can't see you. Well, I've worked remote quite a lot of my career, sitting in my home office. My boss has no clue where I am or what I'm doing. And it's sometimes a challenge to live this out and work you know, a good nine-hour day, even when they don't know what I'm doing. So the motivation has to come from somewhere else. He says, don't just pretend to work hard so that they will treat you well. I've done that. No, you must serve your masters honestly because you respect the Lord. It's got nothing to do with them. It's got nothing to do with the job. It's got everything to do about your relationship with Jesus. Okay. So in all the work you're given, do the best that you can. Work as though you're working for the Lord, not an earthly master. So he hits this point twice over. Says, Don't just you know, mail it in. Work as if you're working directly for God. He can see you all the time. So even when your earthly boss can't see what you're doing, he can, and you're working for him. So remember that you will receive your reward from the Lord. So this temporary stuff of getting money or credits or whatever it is to go and buy your food, that's going to be completely changed when we are with him in eternity. And he's going to give us a, a reward that's directly commensurate to how well we've lived out of this new life and applied these things in our lives. Um, you are serving Christ. He is your real master. So he hits the point again. Remember that anyone who does wrong will be punished for that wrong, just like we are if you, if you mess up at work, you're disciplined. Um, same, same aspects. But the Lord treats everyone the same. There's no favoritism. He doesn't single somebody out for special treatment or for worse treatment. It's his standards that it needs to be met. And that's what he's calling us to. So let's also remember that Jesus worked. So God created, God the Father created and worked. The Son also worked. 
just like me, he had various careers, had various things that he worked at. First of all, he was a carpenter. And we know that he worked, must have worked really hard as a carpenter. And then he was a teacher, a preacher, a healer, a counselor, a leader, and ultimately a savior. But his motivation for working, doing all these things which were hard, is described by himself in John chapter 4, verse 34, where he said, my food is to do what the one who sent me wants me to do. My food is to finish the work that he gave me to do. So he didn't define himself by what he was doing. He defined himself by his relationship as a servant to God the Father. We can do no better than that. So this is the relationship at work that God wants you and me to have. To regard work as coming from him and our reward the result of finishing the work that he has for us to do. Okay, there's another aspect to living out of our new life at work, and that is, like Jesus, to look at doing what God wants us to do as more important than the work activity that we're doing itself. So what does he want us to do? Well, we already talked about it. Paul tells us. He wants us to do all those things that honor each other. He wants us to be patient and to be kind and to love each other and to have good, honest relationships. Um, that's what he wants. That's the work. Of course, there's another aspect which is taking the good news of the gospel to our neighbors, to our colleagues, and the world at large. That's also work that he wants us to do. Jesus directed us himself, saying, go to Samaria, um, the ends of the world, and, and tell them about me. So identifying with Jesus in his death and resurrection into this new life that Paul calls new life gives us a purpose to be lived out in all aspects of our relationships and activities, even at work. So seeing our job or role as a platform that God has given us to do, his work, might just change the way that we relate to that work itself and how we think about it, just as Paul suggests as well. It's amazing that God invites us into this partnership to accomplish his plan. He doesn't need me to get anything done, but apparently he wants me to enter into his plan and, and help him. It's amazing. He wants active participation. He's pleased with me, even when I fail. So this new life is what Paul has defined as gives you this new perspective and this new relationship, this new motivation. So what is this new life? It's pretty simple. How do you get it? The Bible tells us, first of all, that without Jesus, we've missed the mark. So Romans 3.23 uh, Paul writes that all have sinned, which is another word for missing that mark, that standard, and fall short of the glory of God. So all of us were, are in the same boat. The consequences are pretty severe. Again, in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, part A, the wages of sin, missing the mark, are death. But there's good news in part B. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So the reward for working for him, for adopting this new life, is eternal life. We'll never die. And we've all been forgiven. This is the good news. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So we are rescued from the sin by this, um, this gift that's been given to us. So <clears throat> we've all been forgiven, every single one of us. But God wants us to ask him to forgive him, uh, forgive us personally. He wants each one of us to open our hearts to him and cry out, say, I have missed your mark, and I need you uh, for forgiveness to get lay claim to this new life. So if we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths, then he will come in. So in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, we read, Paul uh, says that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will have laid claim to this new life. It's a new beginning. Jesus called it to be born again. So this gift is given to everyone, no matter who you are, what you've done, even if you think God could never love somebody like you, because it's not about how good you are or what you do or your work. It's about how good he is and who he is and the work that he does. So if you want to have a new life and you start, or maybe you just started off a while ago believing, 
but it was a long time and you've been far away from God, uh, then pray with me today and ask Jesus to come into your life to be your master. Let's pray. So Lord God, <clears throat> I'm a sinner by nature. I've missed your mark for a perfect life in relationship with you. But I know that because you love me, you've given me a way to be perfect in your presence through your unconditional love and grace. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to die in my place. I'm sorry for my sin. I want to trust Jesus for forgiveness. I believe that he rose from the dead and is alive today, seated at your right hand, and your spirit is alive in those who believe. Thank you for your gift of eternal life. I want to live for you today. Jesus, please enter into my heart and I submit my life to you right now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We at Pacific Church of Irvine invite you to join us every Sunday at 9.30. You can also visit our website at pacificchurch.com.